your questions at about halfway through the presentation and then again at the end. And if we don't answer your question, um, we will follow up with you via email. Maureen has provided a handout for you that was sent out by email on Friday, and she'll talk about it later on in the session, but if you didn't receive a copy of it, don't worry, you can still participate without it, and we'll send the handout to everyone after the session again. If you'd like a copy of the presentation slides, send me an email and requesting them, and I will be able to uh, send those along to you. And finally, today's session is going to be recorded, and the recording is going to go up on braintumor.ca in the next couple of weeks, so if you know of anybody who wanted to attend but missed the session, they can uh, check, uh, check in with us later on that. So, without any further ado, I'll hand it, uh, hand it over to you, Maureen. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, welcome, everyone. I have to tell you that I am a novice at the webinar technology, but uh, Tanya has this well set up, and I think things will go quite smoothly today, fingers crossed. As Tanya mentioned, uh, the webinar today is the first of two webinars, the next one on February the 23rd. My hope is uh, that um, people who are with us today will be able to uh, make time to join us uh, for that webinar as well. Um, they are two standalone webinars, so uh, slightly different topics, all um, surrounding the theme of caring for yourself as a caregiver. Uh, I think you can participate today and hopefully uh, if you participate today and sign on uh, in a couple of weeks, you will uh, build on what we've talked about today. Uh, having said that, if you know others who were interested and in, couldn't sign on today and might be able to sign on uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I think that they will be able to participate in that webinar uh, without having had the benefit of today's information. So. Uh, I think they are um, two sort of standalone topics that are um, interwoven. So I have some uh, developed some objectives for uh, today's talk. Um, first of all, what I really hope to do is just to acknowledge and validate the contributions that you make uh, as individuals being a caregiver. Being a caregiver is an extraordinarily difficult job, and um, what you do that uh, contributes to the well-being of your loved one, uh, not just with a brain tumor, but uh, a lot of people are caregivers to many people, is really extraordinary and amazing. So uh, I just hope that um, we can take away some appreciation today for what it is that you do and, and what a difference it makes for people. Um, there are some certainly uh, unique aspects also about being a caregiver to somebody who's living with a brain tumor. So I want to spend some time uh, discussing the uniqueness of that particular caregiving situation. And then move on to understanding how the diagnosis of a brain tumor in someone you love can impact your own uh, physical, psychological, and emotional well-being. As Tanya mentioned um, in her introduction, there will be some opportunity for people to ask questions um, throughout the presentation and also an opportunity for um, all of us to share some thoughts and insights just about our own personal view on what it means to be a caregiver. And then briefly we'll talk about uh, some ways of improving your own ability to cope and meet the challenges of your loved one's diagnosis. Um, but some of that will do, that will be uh, a, a smaller part of today's presentation and then we'll move on to um, looking at uh, that in a much broader way because that's a whole webinar in and of itself um, uh, at the presentation in two weeks time. So uh, Tanya did mention that we have the ability to poll our uh, participants today. So this is our first uh, interaction. And I guess what I would um, like to know is just who's out there today. So um, I think Tanya can put uh, a poll up. And if you would just take a minute to um, uh, give us an idea of whether you are the spouse of somebody living with a brain tumor, the parent, uh, a child, friend, or uh, you fit into uh, a category that isn't one of those four, and so um, if you are somebody else. So I'll just give you a minute to um, sort of familiarize yourself with the technology, and, uh, and then we'll just get a better sense of who our participants are today.
So I think, uh, see, it worked. That's great. So um, we have uh, a fairly uh, equal number of spouse and other, and um, also parents, uh, a few parents out there too. So that's great. It's nice to have a mix of people. So um, we will um, move along and forward from there. So the first um, thing I want to sort of give a definition of is what what is caregiver burden? What do we call that? And um, there are a number of definitions out there, but really what caregiver burden um, is is an all-encompassing term used to describe the physical, emotional, and the financial toll taken on somebody who's providing care to somebody else who who needs uh, any number of things. Again, maybe physical support, it might be psychological, emotional, cognitive support, um, all of those things um, that you do for other people make you a caregiver. I want to share some uh, general facts about being a caregiver now. Uh, there is a big uh, army of caregivers out there. Three out of every four families have at least one member who is a cancer survivor. So um, in three out of four families, there's somebody living with just uh, if you, just cancer as a disease, never mind any number of other diseases. So uh, caregiving impacts a large number of people. In particular, uh, cancer survivors, and I'm talking about cancer survivors here because that's really where a uh, diagnosis of a brain tumor sort of fits in best. Um, but when cancer survivors are discharged from hospital, primary um, family members and close friends are usually the ones who, res uh, who assume the responsibility of providing their care. And um, this is um, providing care that um, caregivers who are not professional nurses, uh, rehabilitation people, that kind of thing, but caregivers, loved ones, spouses, friends, uh, children, often have no training to do. Um, and when you think of somebody who is a nurse, for example, nurses spend a number of years learning how to professionally care for people, how to um, bathe people, how to properly transfer people, how to um, provide all that kind of support. And when patients are discharged from hospital into the care of their family, family members don't always have the benefit of this professional training. So there you are, somebody at home now um, with some illness and no proper professional training to do this role which has really been um, uh, given to you without any training. So having to do all of that can certainly lead to a disruption in your own uh, well-being and into the, the things that you're also already responsible for like work and um, caring for other family members, um, doing the things you enjoy. So uh, I want to sort of build on that and um, really talk about also um, some particular um, categories of caregivers. So often um, patients uh, can be elder, or caregivers can be elderly and uh, certainly, it was a revelation when I started to uh, research this talk that um, caregiving spouses who are between the age of 66 and 93 years of age face a 63% increased risk of death when compared to their non-caregiving peers. So um, that reflects certainly what a huge uh, impact becoming a caregiver has on an individual. And for people who are elderly, uh, it's the combination of the prolonged stress of having uh, a loved one who's ill, the physical demands, again, the, the bathing, the transferring, the getting to appointments, and all the normal age-related problems that come when you are elderly. So all of those things really impact on our elderly caregiving population um, to a very significant degree. Often when you have an elderly couple who are living together and managing on their own, it's a very fine balance and um, as long as everybody's okay and doing okay, they manage. But it doesn't take very much 
uh, in the elderly population for the balance to tip and um, all of a sudden what was going along fine is, is not going along fine um, anymore. We also need to look at um, our intergenerational caregivers. So these are, I guess, what uh, mainstream media calls the Gen Xers, so, or the sandwich generation. And these are caregivers who are middle-aged and um, really, again, not exempt from the challenge of juggling um, caregiving with all the other demands that go with being a Generation Xer. So um, often uh, caregivers who are in this category are balancing uh, raising a young family and all the responsibilities that go along with that. And when you throw into the mix um, a family member or a loved one who has been diagnosed with uh, a serious illness like a brain tumor and all the responsibilities that need to be attended to. Um, this category of caregivers often face an increased risk of depression and, and even chronic illness. And certainly uh, when we look specifically at family caregivers, um, family caregivers, so people who look after somebody within their family, um, are certainly less likely to um, practice preventative health care. So of all those people uh, in our audience today who are caregivers, just food for thought. When was the last time you went for uh, a physical exam or, a dent or went to the dentist for a checkup? Um, when you have the responsibility of caring for others, you tend to uh, neglect these things for yourself uh, as well family members who are caregivers to other family members often um, don't take time or make time to participate in activities that that you enjoy like pleasure reading, exercising, um, any number of other things that you do for yourself that in the framework of being a caregiver all of a sudden take a back seat and are so important to maintaining your own um, well-being. In addition, um, the research tells us that family caregivers are certainly at an increased risk of uh, alcohol, drug, and tobacco abuse because of um, the, the weight of responsibility that goes along with um, um, caregiving. I was reading uh, some articles, uh, again, as I was preparing for this presentation, that, that suggested that between 49 and 56 percent of caregivers um, show some degree of depression. So that's a pretty staggering number of, um, of people to be affected. Also, when we look at caregivers versus non-caregivers of any age, um, there are uh, caregivers tend to uh, experience problems with increased blood pressure, increased weight gain, uh, increased cholesterol, and uh, as I mentioned, a significant um, risk of depression when you look at caregivers compared to non-caregivers. So um, it's uh, a huge impact. When we turn uh, more specifically then to looking at what makes being the caregiver to someone with a brain tumor unique. Uh, there are a number of additional factors that, that complicate the situation even further. Um, so when we um, talk about quality of life, that's a term that uh, refers to the general well-being somebody feels. So uh, when you say you have a, a good quality of life, typically people mean that they, they physically feel well, uh, psychologically, they are happy. Um, they have a, a number of other pleasurable activities that they take part in. So that's the kind of thing when we talk about uh, quality of life. It's sort of a broad-based look at um, your wellness. And when you look at the cancer population in general and compare that with caregivers of brain tumor patients, Caregivers of brain tumor patients reported um, a lower quality of life than the average caregiver to um, 
uh, somebody with a diagnosis of some other type of cancer. Um, caregivers of brain tumor patients also um, have to uh, address the challenges that come with the diagnosis of a brain tumor in that patient. And that's things like the neurological deficits that go along with this disease. So when I say neurological deficits, I mean the weakness, uh, the inability to move, um, the um, changes in sensation that people often experience when they have a brain tumor. Those are the kinds of things uh, that we call neurological deficits and have a huge impact on an individual's ability to manage on their own. Um, we don't see that to as great a degree in other types of cancer diagnosis. So dealing with these kinds of things is certainly um, something that um, caregivers to brain tumor patients have to contend with. In addition, um, the sudden onset of a brain tumor, which is, which is a familiar story for many people who are diagnosed, um, and then the functional cognitive problems that can come with the diagnosis, uh, these all present um, additional burden and anxiety um, for caregivers, particularly in patients who have uh, a high-grade tumor, one that is more aggressive and more quickly growing, these symptoms can all come on like a flood. Um, people don't have time uh, to sort of um, get used to the idea and um, the change in the patient can be quite rapid and profound and learning to manage this and cope with the, the psychological impact of that can be very difficult. Having said that, um, patients who have less aggressive uh, but slower gr and slower growing tumors um, are not exempt and neither are their caregivers from the hardships that a brain tumor can bring. So um, even with slow growing tumors, the, the kinds of changes that we see in patients can be also quite profound. Um, they may not come on as quickly as uh, with a tumor that is more quickly growing, but they can be insidious and, um, and um, patients with uh, lower grade tumors often have a, a, a longer prognosis. So um, while the changes don't occur rapidly, they do occur gradually and for a prolonged period of time so that the caregiving experience is really extended um, over time and that can have an uh, uh, impact on how well people manage as well. When you look at uh, the challenges confronted by caregivers of brain tumor patients too, so again there's decreased mobility, personality changes, um, impaired cognition and when, it, when I say cognition what I mean is that, uh, somebody's ability to think uh, patients often experience a loss of independence. There can be a loss of income, not just um, because the patient may not be able to work at certain times during your diagnosis, but when you are now the full-time caregiver to somebody, your ability to work and perform uh, the job that you do outside of the home may also be impacted, and so that can result in a loss of um, income. Uh, loss of income often leads to lifestyle changes when um, your finances are turned upside down. And uh, again, what we often hear from caregivers for our, our brain tumor population is uh, often in a family there are defined roles um, that each member takes on. And when all of a sudden that one member is not able to do what they normally do, somebody else has to pick up um, those responsibilities and this can cause extraordinarily extraordinary stress um, by caregivers of brain tumor patients when um, people aren't able to work again there can be financial problems that impact on the family um, when you're trying to balance the patient's needs and caring for children living at home at the same time um, sometimes the patient is a child um, and if you have other children trying to maintain that 
degree of balance and uh, addressing what the other children in the house need can be a very challenging um, problem. Uh, again, there are a multitude of household responsibilities, laundry, cleaning, cooking, all of those things. And um, I come back to, again, the um, difficulty of trying to uh, take on the professional caregiving activities. So uh, all of a sudden, as a caregiver, you're now responsible for administering medication and not just um, Tylenol and aspirin, but all of a sudden medications that are um, important and um, powerful medications. So um, chemotherapy, anti-seizure medications, all of those things um, that weigh on people when you appreciate the understanding of um, the importance and the, the possible side effects that go along with this. So um, these are, uh, again, among the challenges that are um, a part of being a caregiver for a brain tumor patient. And then there aren't just physical challenges. Um, I mentioned briefly before about the, the neurocognitive and the neurobehavioral impairments that can be associated with a brain tumor diagnosis. Um, patients by sometimes by virtue of the location of their tumor, sometimes by virtue of the medication that they're taking, um, their ability to think and process information is impacted. And um, again, caregivers who are family members or friends are not necessarily adequately equipped to properly address these issues in a way that is helpful and um, uh, beneficial to the patient. Uh, attention deficits, communication problems, impaired thinking, all of those things are uh, truly a big part of um, living with a brain tumor. I also wanted to talk uh, just very briefly about something called anticipatory grief. And this is not something uh, that is unique to caregivers of brain tumor patients, but it is certainly very, very applicable. Um, anticipatory grief is the grief that occurs before an, an impending loss. And um, in working with caregivers of brain tumor patients for a number of years now, I hear caregivers talk about this very regularly. Um, in the case of a brain tumor patient, anticipatory grief is really losing that sense of the person that you knew prior to um, uh, their um, passing away because these patients can sometimes experience personality changes that make them a very different person from the individual that you knew. Um, makes them um, a more dependent person than the person you knew. And so anticipatory grief um, is a big part of being a caregiver um, in many cases to somebody with a brain tumor. And certainly just grief in general, we can do a whole webinar um, and perhaps even Tanya is planning this, we can, there could be a whole uh, webinar just on grief and um, dealing with that. But generally grief as an emotion is an exhausting experience and so um, that impacts on your ability to um, perform your duties as a caregiver as well. Not only are you overwhelmed by um, the, the responsibilities that you carry, but completely exhausted by them as well. So I'm going to just take a, a brief um, break here and just we'll try another phase of our technology uh, and just want to check in to see whether anybody has any questions before we move on um, in the webinar. So uh, if you do have any questions, you can take a minute uh, to type them in um, and we can try and address them. Um, and if not, um, don't get too comfortable because I'm going to make you work a little bit um, in a second. Anyway, 
So Maureen, I just wanted to check in with you as well. So far we don't have any questions coming in yet, but um, again a reminder to everybody you can ask questions now or at any time during the second half of the webinar and we'll, we'll be able to take those up at the end as well. So if you have any, any questions, um, feel free to send them out and, uh, and we'll be able to reply to those uh, towards the end as well. Or if it's something that you're thinking of right at the very end and we don't get a chance to answer that question, we'll follow up with you by email and you can send any questions to me as well by email um, and we'll get back to you in the next couple of days with an answer about that. So, Maureen, you can uh, okay. keep on storming ahead. And, okay. um, but remember, if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, feel free to send them on in and we will uh, we'll take those up. Great. Okay. So we'll move along. Um, and as I said, I'm going to um, ask people to work a little bit. Um, and what uh, I want you to do, and I don't want you to think about it too much, I just want you to sort of uh, think the, the first thing that comes to your mind. But in one sentence, I want you to describe the most difficult aspect of caregiving for you. Um, and again, don't think about it too much. Usually the most difficult thing uh, is the thing that comes to mind first. So um, give that some thought. And uh, I'm not going to, or we won't uh, necessarily ask people to share those thoughts. Uh, that's one um, great aspect of the webinar is that we can get you thinking about these things, but we don't uh, want to ask you to, to put that information out for, for everyone to, to be um, uh, aware of. Um, as you're thinking about that though, I, I want to share uh, some, when I asked other caregivers or when I've asked other caregivers the same question, just some of the things um, that they've uh, shared. And, and as background to the, the quotes I'm going to share with you, um, these are all from people who are extraordinarily capable, organized, high functioning people in their regular life and these are the things that they were sharing um, that they found challenging. So uh, this is a lady again her husband was uh, diagnosed uh, with a brain tumor and um, a very aggressive one and um, she just said these days are uh, challenging for me and she said I know that's normal but um, you know, the paperwork, the banking, the insurance issues that, you know, I need to now take responsibility for um, are overwhelming in some, some days. And, uh, you know, trying to put a positive spin on it, she says, I guess it does keep me busy sorting things out. But um, just really uh, a huge change for her. Um, another uh, wife of a patient who said, you know, I feel horrible. Um, this was a gentleman whose chemotherapy was delayed and just that it's been a month since he should have started his chemo and now with all this recent um, activity, home care, etc., etc., I'm just not thinking clearly. So um, again, somebody who very capable, high functioning, organized to a fault actually and this is how um, they're experiencing their caregiver. Um, responsibilities. Um, this is a quote uh, from a lady who I've shared this uh, in other presentations I've done about caregiving because it actually had such a, uh, an aha moment for me. I was talking to this lady uh, one day. She had a very full plate of responsibilities. And I said to her, naively, do you ever take a day for yourself? And she looked at me and said, I don't need a day to do nothing. I need a day with nothing to do. And it didn't strike me until she reinforced that to me that those are two very different things. And often as a caregiver, even when somebody uh, can convince you to take a day for yourself, um, it's hard always to set aside the um, knowledge and idea that there are a number of things that are waiting for you when you come back from your day off. And so this um, uh, was a very poignant reminder to me, or uh, uh, aha moment, as I said, that uh, really reinforced that um, even when you take a day off, there are things waiting for you when you come back. And the ideal thing would be to have a day with nothing to do. Um, this is another uh, quote that I really 
um, love because again it was given uh, told to me by uh, a caregiver who was um, you know looking doing a an amazing job of um, being a caregiver, um, looking after all the details, and um, she reflected that people would often come to visit uh, her husband um, and spend time with him and um, devote a lot of time to him, and she was always so grateful for people who did that. But uh, she said she found it difficult when people would be leaving she said, with their hand on the doorknob. She, they would look at her and say, how are you doing? And um, felt uh, somewhat sort of as an afterthought that um, people were not really understanding how um, challenging the illness was for her. And so she used to, her, her response was always, I'm fine. Um, and that was her code because fine stood in her mind for frustrated, insecure, nervous, and exhausted. And uh, she got a lot of um, uh, reassurance, I guess, out of being able to simply uh, tell people in her own uh, coded way that uh, how she was, in fact, actually doing. Um, and finally, uh, I think uh, this quote really just uh, gives uh, a really nice sort of summing up of um, what it's like to be a caregiver. You know, how can I focus on my needs when I hardly have enough time in a day to breathe? So, um, so those are just um, a few sort of other reflections from other caregivers um, that um, may resonate with you um, in your caregiving role as well and uh, hopefully help you to appreciate that it's actually very normal to, to experience these kinds of feelings and emotions. So what is it? Um, that makes people as caregivers so reluctant to um, seek care or to care for themselves. And again, this is some things that we often hear um, caregivers reflect on, is that um, it's selfish to put my own needs ahead of those of my sick loved one. Um, it's too frightening and overwhelming to think about what I need in addition to what my loved one needs. And um, typically people will also say that they just feel inadequate if they have to ask for help, that, that it makes it seem like nobody can, um, if they can't do it, um, then nobody, somebody else shouldn't be asked to do it. They, they have the Superman syndrome and, and feel like if they're asking for help, then somehow that suggests that they're inadequate. So often what we hear caregivers describe, and uh, I suspect that some of this will resonate with um, some of you out there today, is that caregivers start to experience caregiver burnout. Um, and that's what happens when you don't place sufficient importance on your own um, well-being. So caregiver burnout is sort of defined as a state of emotional uh, and mental, physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion that may be accompanied by or may result in um, a change in your, your caregiving attitude from one of positive and caring to negative and unconcerned. Um, caregivers absolutely can experience physical responses to stress that are associated to the stress that is associated with being a caregiver. Things like aches and pains, diarrhea and constipation, dizziness, rapid heartbeat or chest pain, um, eating too much or not enough, sleeping too much or not enough, uh, nervous habits such as nail biting or pacing. Um, and again, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, caregivers are at significant risk for alcohol, tobacco, and drug abuse related to the stress that comes along um, with being a caregiver. 
so uh, I did want to talk uh, briefly about caregiver burden because this is this is quite um, interesting research. Um, research, when you look at the studies, it shows that um, the level of burden that caregivers seem to perceive does not necessarily always correlate with the duration of time they spend caregiving or um, the progression of memory loss in the family member who's receiving their care. So what, what that means is that um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily follow that um, the sicker somebody is, the more burdened a caregiver feels. So um, again, there's also studies that suggest that the degree of functional impairment, so again, the degree of neurological functional impairment in the person receiving care does not, again, always correlate with caregiver burden. Um, so um, there is some correlation with the degree of behavioral problems in patients with dementia. And again, dementia is sometimes um, not dementia, but memory problems, which are similar, um, some can contribute to caregiver burden, and we see that reflected again in the research. Um, so people um, sometimes, um, when a patient often is less functionally impacted, caregivers can feel more burdened, um, and sometimes when a patient is more functionally impacted caregivers, feel less burdened. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the reason for that is, but um, certainly that is um, an interesting re was an interesting revelation to me. Um, we run a support group at the Penser Center uh, at Princess Margaret Hospital. Our support group model is one where we run two support groups simultaneously, so one for patients and one for caregivers. So patients and caregivers come to the group together at the same time, but the patients meet separately in one group and the caregivers meet separately in another group. Um, and so we are actually in the process of looking at how that model works. Um, but throughout the course of the caregiver group, um, we often, um, I'm just listed here, some of the most frequent themes that come up for discussion within the caregiver group. Um, uh, caregivers talk about uh, the difficulty of looking after themselves, about the burden they feel being um, placed in this caregiver situation, um, the anxiety that they experience as a result of their caregiving role, um, and how they cope with the, the reality of that diagnosis. They talk about the challenges of managing cognitive changes, and also often talk about the, the sense of loss um, and grief and the sadness and anger that go along with that when they are living with a loved one or caring for a loved one with a brain tumor, um, and also, again, the issues around supporting children um, and, and talking about and confronting end-of-life issues. So um, that's, those are the themes that come up most often in our caregiver group. And I was talking to Tanya just before we got started with the webinar. Um, our, care group, care, our support group model um, it, as I said, is one of two separate groups, but uh, on occasion, just to uh, try and um, uh, shake things up a bit, I guess, we often, um, or we suggest from time to time that we combine the two groups. And the patients um, are quite happy to have that happen, um, but the caregivers are always very vocal that they appreciate the um, the isolation of their caregiver support group and the support they get from their fellow caregivers and the opportunity to talk freely in a group amongst people who understand what they are living with and uh, they can share these things in a non-judgmental way. So, um, so uh, that's been an interesting revelation for us um, in the course of our support groups as well. I want to um, put everybody to work again now. So this is um, the handout that Tanya had forwarded to um, everyone who had um, registered prior to yesterday, I guess. Um, this is the Zeric Burden Interview, and there are a number of questionnaires that sort of 
uh, hope to capture the um, subjective experience of being a caregiver. This one, but this one is the most widely referenced. And what it is, um, you will have it in front of you, is uh, a list of 22 items that reflect on, ask you to reflect on your caregiving experience and um, how you feel about that. So um, I think we'll just um, quickly go through the uh, the scale and uh, again certainly won't be asking people to share your answers so please um, feel free to uh, um, write down your true score and um, and then we'll um, go from there but uh, really be quite honest with yourself because this is an opportunity um, to understand um, sort of how caregiving is perhaps impacting you so the first item, um, I think it's pretty easy to see on the screen, and again, you should have a copy, and if you don't, we'll get you one. But the first item asks you to consider, um, do you feel that your relative asks uh, for more help than he or she needs? And this score is from zero, which is never, to four, which is nearly always. So um, on a scale of one to four, do you feel that, when we say relative, we can certainly substitute um, my brain tumor um, patient in there. Um, the second item asks, do you feel that because of the time you spend with your um, brain tumor patient that you don't have enough time for yourself? And again, on a scale of from never to nearly always. The third item um, asks you to consider, do you feel stressed between caring for your uh, loved one and trying to meet the responsibilities of your family and or your work. Number four asks, do you feel embarrassed over your loved one's behavior? Uh, number five, do you feel angry when you are around your relative? Um, moving on to number six. Do you feel that your loved one currently affects your relationship with other family members or friends in a negative way? <clears throat> uh, number seven asks you to consider, are you afraid what the future holds for your loved one? Number eight is, do you feel your loved one is dependent on you? And again, this uh, interview sort of is looking at a lot of different uh, facets of uh, being a caregiver and um, so uh, it, it's a, a, a broadly, um, uh, it's an all-encompassing scale. Do you feel, um, in number nine, do you feel strained when you are around your loved one? Number ten, do you feel your health has that? Do you feel that your health has suffered because of your involvement with your loved one? Number eleven asks: Do you feel that you don't have as much privacy as you would like because of your loved one? Number twelve asks you to think about: Do you feel that your social life has suffered because you are caring for your loved one? And number 13 uh, asks, do you feel uncomfortable about having friends over because of your loved one? And again, just want to reinforce uh, before we go on to the last few items um, in the scale um, that nobody can see your answers and so um, give it uh, some thought and um, see if you can um, answer honestly. Uh, moving on to number 14, um, do you feel that your relative seems to expect you to take care of him or her as if you were the only one he or she could depend on? Number 15 asks, do you feel that you don't have enough money to take care of your loved one in addition to the rest of your expenses? Number 16 asks you to think about, do you feel that you are unable to take care of your relative much longer? Number 17 is, do you feel you have lost control of your life since your loved one's illness? 
the number 18. Do you wish you could leave the care of your loved one to someone else? Number 19, do you feel uncertain about what to do about your loved one? And number 20, do you feel you should be doing more for your loved one? Number 21, do you feel you could do a better job in caring for your loved one? And finally, number 22, overall, how burdened do you feel in caring for your loved one? So I'll give you um, just a minute or so to finish up and, and, and you'll all have copies of this. So um, we may have gone through this uh, a little um, quickly, but I'm sort of aware of the time. So um, if you want to come back and revisit it and uh, go through the questions again and give them some more thought, that's certainly um, up to you. And I encourage you to do that. There's the, um, the score for scoring of the, the interview. And again, if you scored 0 to 21, you have little or no burden. 21 to 40 uh, is characterized as mild to moderate burden. And 41 to 60, uh, moderate to severe. And 61 to 88 is uh, categorized as severe burden. Now, again, this isn't um, a uh, uh, scale that's been designed exclusively for caregivers of brain tumor patients, but um, I think that uh, certainly it does reflect many of the issues that come up with being a caregiver to a brain tumor patient. Um, and so I think it's a good reflection or a good way of sort of evaluating where you're feeling in terms of uh, the stress of being a caregiver. So uh, this is purely, like I said, a self-educating exercise for you to, in the hopes of helping you um, get a handle on where you might be sitting in terms of your own stress, your own caregiving stress. Um, so I want to um, just sort of highlight uh, today some of the um, stresses and 10 signs of uh, caregiver stress. Um, denial about the situation can be um, certainly a hallmark of um, being a caregiver of a brain tumor. People will, will sometimes say everything's fine. Um, sometimes people uh, experience anger, uh, withdraw from social activities that they previously got great enjoyment from find they are feeling anxious a lot of the time or depressed, um, they are exhausted, and despite their exhaustion often can't get proper sleep, um, maybe irritable and, and short-tempered, um, can't concentrate on anything, um, let alone um, all the things that need to get done, but some of the things that you'd like to get done, you just Patient, or caregivers often tell me they just don't have the, the um, concentration capabilities right now to do those things. And the associated health problems that um, come. Um, I'm suspecting that some of these things resonate with um, a lot of our uh, participants today. I guess what I also wanted to reinforce is that um, you need to take control of the situation where you can. And um, in reality, there isn't a lot you can do to stop the impact of the illness on your loved one. Um, of course, um, you know, assisting with um, administering treatment like chemotherapy and that kind of thing, to a certain extent do that, but, but over and above that, you can't um, impact on the illness itself. But as a caregiver, what you can do is take steps to assure your own well-being and preserve your ongoing ability to be a loving, effective caregiver. Because um, if you fall apart um, or are unable to provide care to those who depend on you, then um, that just has a, a domino effect and everybody will find themselves worse off. So. Um, I guess as part of our webinar today, I really 
want to reinforce the importance of caring for yourself as a caregiver. Um, you're the glue that keeps everybody together, and so you need to um, place significant um, priority and importance on keeping yourself vital and healthy and uh, well. I'm just going to talk very briefly today. This is sort of a teaser for um, the webinar in two weeks' time, um, 10 Ways to Reduce Stress. And again, uh, we're going to have a whole um, another hour in a couple of weeks to talk about this in depth. But some ways that I thought I would just um, put out there for you to think about between now and then, if you're able to join us, and, and that's to uh, learn about the illness that it is uh, you are helping to care for an in individual that you love. Um, be realistic about that illness and be realistic about how much you can do to impact that. Um, you need to accept that um, uh, you're going to have mixed feelings about this. There's no doubt that you love and care for the person that you are caring for, but that doesn't come without often feelings of anger and sometimes uh, frustration and guilt. So uh, you need to um, understand that that's normal and, and to accept that. Um, find uh, a way to share information and feelings with others and try to focus on things that you can do as opposed to the things you can't change. Humor is wonderful medicine and even when things are not going as well as you might like them to be, um, the ability to find a, a way to smile or something that will make you laugh uh, can have a lot of benefit. You need to uh, take care of yourself and ask for help from family and friends and professionals um, so that you can continue on in your caregiving capacity. And you need to um, think about taking uh, concrete steps or making concrete plans to deal with all of those um, important details in life that um, once you look after them, uh, you don't have to think about them anymore and they don't have to weigh on you as well. So again, uh, I'm not going to um, uh, talk too much more about this today, but this will sort of give us something to build on for our webinar um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and so finally, what I was hoping that we could do is end on a positive note because although we've uh, talked today about the challenges and the difficulties of being a caregiver, um, again my experience has been in talking to caregivers over the years that there are great and significant rewards that come with being a caregiver as well. And while um, uh, nobody chooses to be in this circumstance of living with a brain tumor. Um, there are gifts that come from it sometimes. And so in one sentence, again, not to share with anybody else today, but in one sentence, uh, I encourage you to take a minute to write down what is the most rewarding aspect of being a caregiver for you personally. And again, I, I'm able to share with you um, just a few reflections from other caregivers who I have had the great um, pleasure to know in what they have shared. Um, and so, again, here uh, is a husband uh, telling me that for us, knowing that we have this tumor to deal with makes us live um, life to the fullest. And, and so, um, they have found a way to see that in a, a positive light. Um, another uh, lady who was an amazing, is an amazing caregiver, and um, she talked about her ability to help her husband uh, stay at home throughout the course of his illness. And she said uh, it was a very difficult time for her, but, it, but um, she also found that it made her feel very capable and very proud um, of the way she managed things and um, that she was able to give her husband a 
very special gift, and she thought that was a very rewarding part of being a caregiver. And finally, um, again, this is something that I often hear our caregivers reflect on, um, that because of um, the individual's illness, lifestyles change, and in this particular instance, um, this couple spent five years uh, really doing a lot of things together that um, had they not had the diagnosis of a brain tumor to contend with, they may have not had or taken that opportunity. And so uh, they both felt that it definitely brought them closer together. So um, they were able to find that silver lining in their brain tumor journey. So at this point, we'll try one more time to see if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer them. I, I guess what I also should have said um, at the get-go, and I could have, or I will for next time, uh, put my email address in a slide. So if people want to email me directly, um, they can. But uh, for today's presentation, because I didn't do that, um, you can email Tanya, and she will certainly um, pass along any questions that um, come along after the presentation. So Maureen, we actually do have one question that's come in and okay. uh, this individual is asking, do you feel the si that the signs of burnout can come and go? Not daily necessarily, but um, she says that sometimes the exhaustion and moodiness and concentration come and go. Some days are really good and some days are bad. Is this normal? Absolutely normal, and you know that's uh, that's such a great question because I should have addressed that. Um, it is a roller coaster ride, and um, they can come and go. Depends on what's happening with the patient. It depends on happening what's happening with your own situation, um, and so it's completely normal that some days are good days and some days are just lousy days. Um, my um, uh, suggestion about that is um, when you're having a good day, enjoy that good day and try not to think about what tomorrow is going to be like or what yesterday was like, but just take that good day for the good day it is. And when you're having a really crummy day, um, you know, some days are just crummy days and you get through them and um, focus on you know, that there are still good days to come. Okay, and that's all we have for questions. So, uh, Maureen, I'll let you wrap up. So, I just wanted to say, um, first of all, thank you for um, to everyone who joined us today. And um, it's uh, always a real honor and um, pleasure for me to um, be able to work with the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Um, I hope it was helpful in some respect to our participants. And um, again, my last bit of shameless self-promotion is that we will have another webinar in two weeks' time. So um, I hope you will um, perhaps be able to join us. And certainly, if you know others who might be interested, uh, we would welcome their participation as well. So have a good day, everybody, and thanks again. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen, for joining us, and thank you everybody for uh, for joining us for this presentation today. And as uh, Maureen has mentioned, there is she has another webinar coming up in two weeks, and we have another two webinars that uh, will be happening in the month of March, and so you can register for those. Those are free as well, and all of these sessions will be recorded and put up on our website. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll stay on the line for another couple of minutes if you have any other questions, or like we've said, you can feel free to send us your questions uh, via email or you can give us a call and we'll pass those along to Maureen if you'd like her to answer them personally. So have a great day. Um, if, you're, if it's sunny out where you are, then go out and enjoy the sun. And if not, uh, have a great rest of your Saturday and we'll hopefully